Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Gagno Atelier. I'm your old pal, Tim Gagno, and today we've got a great show for you. I'm excited. I'm going to have my friend Patrick Reynolds on, and we're going to be talking about his art, his career, uh, his life, everything and everything uh, that you can imagine. But the one thing we're going to be talking about uh, is art festivals and how they work. Uh, some of you uh, that are artists that are wanting to try an art festival or you've seen them, you're not sure exactly how they work, um, how they can work for you, all of that. Well, Patrick is what I call the king of the art festivals. He really is. And so he's going to be coming on and talking to us about uh, that and a lot of other things. We're going to have a great time. Uh, he's an old buddy of mine uh, way back in the day uh, when I was making my transition, uh, starting my transition plan from uh, hobbyist artist uh, to full-time artist uh, when I was still working uh, a day job. Uh, even though my day job were as a professional artist, I was always working for someone else. And uh, in the beginning, when I was trying to make that transition and making a plan to transfer over to full-time fine artists working for this guy and that guy, and that's it, um, I started talking to him and uh, he was there to give me some great advice. So we're going to be talking to him. I'm super excited. Uh, if you could do me a favor, uh, if you like these podcasts, uh, make sure that you uh, go right down here and you look and you see that little scrolling thing across the bottom of the screen, right there it is. It goes this way. Uh, go ahead and like uh, this uh, broadcast, uh, hit the like button hit uh, the share button, or if you could do a watch party, that would be fantastic. I would love it if you could do a watch party. Uh, we would love to uh, see you do that. Also, if you can go to the Gagno Atelier Facebook page and like our page, that would be great. Uh, that would be fantastic. I really appreciate that. Also, uh, if you're interested in this content and past uh, videos that uh, you might want to see, some of the interviews we've had, you can find a lot of our older videos. We are putting them on our YouTube channel. So if you can go over to the Gagno Atelier YouTube channel and hit the fancy schmancy subscribe button, I would really appreciate that because what we've done is we not only have the uh, previous interviews that we did on Facebook Live are over there on that page, we also have special content just on that channel. And so we've got some great things there, some tutorial videos. Uh, we've got some videos on just me plein air painting, talking about different subjects. And so uh, the Gagno Atelier uh, YouTube channel is where that is at. If you're interested in learning about my art and uh, the stuff that I'm working on right now, you can visit uh, my website, illuminatedmessiah.com, where you can learn about the Illuminated Messiah Art Exhibit and Bible Project. Uh, we're really excited about that. You can learn all about that also on YouTube as well. Uh, so anyway, guys, with that said, uh, thank you for watching. Today is going to be awesome. So I am going to bring in... Ah, uh, here we go. Here he comes in just a few seconds. He'll be here eventually. Here we go. Oh, I got to turn me off. That's why. There we go. And there he is. One of these days I'm going to get this thing figured out, my friends. But Patrick, welcome to the show. Welcome to Thank the you. Thank you, Mr. Master. Tim. It's quite the honor to be in your show. I tell you that. Oh, gosh. Man. Keep, keep, keep about buttering this. up, man. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you you are definitely the god of the of the interview for artists for sure. I, I've been watching these these videos that you've been making that they're astonishingly great. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate that. You know, it's 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 been quite the journey. We started this um, you know a couple months ago, and uh, the videos have been just growing and spreading. Our viewership has been growing, and uh, people seem to like it. And so we're keeping doing it. And uh, it, it's really great. We've got something like I'm booked with artists now all the way through July. Wow. And so I'm trying to find like artists for August now. And yeah. um, it's just we're booked through. And we've got we have had the privilege of interviewing some of the top artists in their genres. And I really like that we're not just, you know, um, because I'm a figurative artist, figurative portrait artist, it's like, most of the artists I know are figurative artists as well, because those are who I'm rubbing elbows with, you know, uh, when I go to conferences and things like that. 
but we have been having a lot of other artists here. We had a sculptor uh, last week, uh, Gavin, uh, Gavin Gardner. He was talking to us about Silver Point, uh, which is yeah. something that uh, I just started playing with. And man, I love that. And so he's been, uh, he came on and he's a world-class sculptor. And then we've yeah. had, you know, everybody from Nancy Rayner, who is like, you know, she is the uh, authority on acrylic paint. And yeah. uh, she is, she's written all of, I mean, if like she's got like five or six books that are like, if you want to learn about acrylic paint, those are the books you have to have. They're, they're the yeah. must read books. In a lot of ways, they're the acrylic Bibles. Oh, um, excellent. Wow. You know, and so we've had some great, great artists. It's coming up. I'm just blown away by, by some of the people I have. But I really am excited to have you on today um, because of your expertise in, 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 the, in the field of the art festivals and the way that you market your artwork and the way that you've made a living as an artist. I'm really excited to have you on. And uh, your art has always inspired me. It's, it, I remember back in the day, my viewers, Back in the day, Patrick had an, a gallery in the Panama City Mall. <laughs> and this is way back when the Panama City Mall, I mean, Panama City Mall, it, it doesn't, after, since Hurricane Michael, it doesn't even exist anymore. And there was a lot of people that went to that mall. It was shocking. There was. It was a packed mall. But you would think nobody's going to buy art in this mall. But you right. did. You yeah. did. And the mall. And, the mall loved me because I brought a whole different clientele there. You really did. And, you know, it, what, what amazed me, one of the things that's always amazed me about you is, is you have this, it's like just a God-given, like, anointing over you. You can sell art. And yeah. you know how it can to be taught. sell art. And you know how to do it in air. It, you could put 10 artists in the same spot that you are in and they wouldn't sell anything. You would go in there and you'd be selling and you're selling like this. And, and that's really one of the things that, you know, guys, if, if you're, if you are an artist and you're wanting to learn how to sell your art, you need to tune in right now, or you need to, if you've got a friend that is one of those artists, you need to pick up the phone and call them or text them or something or Facebook messaging them this link because uh, you're going to learn something and uh, it's yep. going to be good. And I've got my notepad, right? <laughs> you know, it's a good thing because uh, as you were talking about that, it must be some kind of a, a anointing, whatever. But I, I tell you, it can be taught. It can yes. definitely be taught. It's a, it's a skill that you learn. So if I'm you like don't think that you have it, you know, know this, that you do have it. It's all within you. You just have to learn the skills and want to do it. You know, it's, it's, I'm glad you said that. One of the things, I, I, my, my friend Shane Levinson, I went to college with her, and uh, she, she's on a rocket ship. And, and one of the things that I love about Shane is she likes to post these pictures of the paintings, the self-portraits that she did in college, and then the self-portrait she did yesterday. Yeah. And, you know, from 2015, 2020, and she'll put them side by side, just kind of like we are on the screen right now. Mm -hmm. And the difference is shocking. And, and I like to show those pictures. I save them and I put them in a slideshow for my, for my students. And I put the tagline. It's a quote from a, I think he's a famous basketball player. I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure. You think I should memorize this, but there's a quote that says hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And it's the same thing what you're saying, you know, it's like, yep. um, as an artist, people think, oh, well, you just have this natural talent that you were born with. And that's almost insulting to an artist because it <laughs> negates or denies you the hard work you put in. Exactly. You know? yeah. And Michelangelo said, if people knew how hard I worked to achieve my mastery, they wouldn't think it was wonderful at all. Right. You wouldn't go to the dentist, you know, saying, well, you know, I just read a book yesterday and don't worry, I have a natural ability to do this. Just lay down and trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'd be like, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, no. I don't have much practice, but I did read a really good book on it. So I. Yeah, I stayed at what was that? I stayed at the Holiday Inn. <laughs> yeah, right. I stayed at the Holiday Inn. <laughs> no. But, but you know, I always tell people there's there's a thing called the ten thousand hour clause. Yes. And the ten thousand hour clause is that's about average of how long it takes you to learn and master something or anything. And uh, that's, that's about five years, you figure. 
So yeah. I always give myself, you know, if, if I'm going to try something new or whatever, uh, 10,000 hours, keep that in the back of your mind. You're not going to learn it tomorrow. You know, always give yourself right. some time and some latitude to actually get used to it. It's like some people try to try to play the piano. You, you, first you play chopsticks, you know, then you learn the basics of a, of, of a certain song and then you can play it pretty fluently. Then next thing you know, you can play it with passion. You know, right. but it takes time, you know, from chopsticks to playing it with passion. Right. And it's same the same thing with anything else. With art, you know, anybody can learn to draw. Anyone can learn to paint. And it's all about how much mm -hmm. you put into it. How much effort are you going to put into it? You know, I've yeah. got students that when they started with me, I, you know, it's like I've, they, the first time after six weeks with me, most of my students, they are painting a portrait from life, a live model sitting in front of them yeah. for the first time in their lives. And they are absolutely terrified. Yeah. yeah. Well, three, four years in, I can put a live model in front of them and they're painting it and it looks like mm -hmm. the person, you know, oh, and, yeah. and it doesn't, anybody can learn it. You know, anybody yeah. can learn it. It's, it's, it's how much work you're willing to put into learning yeah. the new skill. You're absolutely right. So. And sometimes it's a lot of work. If you talk to like a professional golfer, for instance, the average golfer, you know, the weekend golfer, he'll go out there and practice with a bucket of balls, you know, get, get warmed up. The mm -hmm. pro golfer, a lot of these guys, a thousand balls a day is what they do. Yes. You know, so yeah. the difference is dramatic, really dramatic. You know, so it's not that they have yeah. this God given ability. It's just they have a this God given passion inside that they want to so bad that they're willing to work that hard. Yeah. And, and, and that's really it. You know, I mean, uh, we're using sports analogies now, you know, Michael Jordan, you know, always said yeah. that, you know, his biggest thing was, is he misses more shots than he's, than, than he gets. Yeah. And, but he throws so many, he's practiced so much at shooting yeah. that yeah. he's gotten another with, you know, tens of thousands of times he's thrown a basketball at a net. You know, me, yeah. I'm, I could throw a basketball in the Gulf of Mexico and I'd hit the rim. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, same, the, uh, same thing with John Wooden, you know, the basketball coach. You know, he he always had his players, no matter how talented they were, he had them always doing the basics, you know, yeah. for hours. And yeah. but they were in great shape. So in that key clutch moment, they didn't panic. Right. You know, off, it like is. It's all about it's all about training. You know, my, my yeah. biggest thing and my students hate it. But, you know, my, my thing is, is that I do value scales. Yeah. yeah. Constantly. And I do uh, color charts and color yep. wheels constantly. Um, and, I do, and things like that. Yeah. Great. And I paint, I, you know, I paint and draw the white ball yeah. and do shading on it all the time mm -hmm. so that I keep my skills sharp. It's like doing the basics is, yeah. you know, to me, every six months, every artist should stop and take a week and yeah. do value scales, color wheels, and draw the ball in charcoal to make sure you're getting your shadow shapes perfect and do that. And go back to those basic skills That's and just work on them for a week, just a week, take a week and do yeah. nothing with that. And it just, man, when you go back to doing the hard stuff, it's like, whoa, the yeah. difference, you know? When I, was, when I was younger, I thought I could draw. You know, I was I was self-assuming. Wow, I am I'm pretty good at this. You know, not never realizing that later on in life, I had the opportunity for a paint company to go to Europe, to Italy, Switzerland, Germany, and teach their product to those people. Now, what happened was, which I didn't realize, I would be in the midst of really serious artists, like big time, fantastic artists. And I ended up learning so much more than I could ever teach, you know, and I've maintained all of that. Well, since then, you know, and I, I always right. keep in touch with them and they, they ask me some different things what I'm doing these days. But anyhow, but it was it was similar. I always use this analogy, like in art schools in America, they'll they'll teach you. Here's an apple. Draw the apple. You have five hours and I want to see a great apple. Uh, whereas in Europe, like like an understudy or something like that, they'll have that same apple and they'll say, OK, here's an apple. I want 300 apples by five o'clock and I want some of the apples to be happy and I want some of the apples to feel angry and some of the apples uh, to, to be ecstatic and then sad and all these types of things. 
putting passion in the drawing, not the, not the not the, the piece itself. But how does it right. how does it make you feel? And that is special. You know, once you learn to pull that off with with an apple, you can do it with anything. You know, and, right? You know, uh, it's the basics. You can't go wrong with those basic those yeah. basic uh, methods. You know, and it's like people get. It, what I call a young artist, yeah. you know, a novice, uh, an amateur, or someone that's that, that's that, that's new, they don't want to do the fancy stuff. You know, it's like I'll see portfolios or kids will come in, and you know, it's like when I when I was getting started when when I got out of the military and I got out of the comic book industry and I was trying to break in and all these things. Uh, you know, it's like anybody can draw. You know, a lot of people can draw Spider Man. They can yeah. draw dynamic poses. The problem is you got to draw New York City behind him. Mm -hmm. And you got to get all those windows right. You have to get the perspective perfect. You got to get the car because if one window is off on that skyscraper, you see it. Yeah. Everybody notices it. Yeah. You know? And so it's like that's the thing. It's like you've got to know how to draw everything and draw it well. And you got to know the techniques and, and all of that. And a lot of people they, they they concentrate only on the fancy stuff. Yeah. And they neglect yeah. the the fundamentals. And I remember an uh, artist uh, named Mark Bagley. Uh, years ago, uh, when he critiqued me, he says, you you have to master the rules mm -hmm. before you can bend the rules because you can never break the rules. Yeah. But you, you can't bend them until you master them. You know, that, I tell lots of the young people that ask me about how to get forward in their drawing art and so forth. I always tell them to get, get a drawing book, a flat page, and get a grid and make about 50 squares on one page, little squares, and then draw a right hand 50 times. You know, just keep drawing it over and over and over and over. Then next page, draw a left hand over and over and over and over and over. Then draw a nose, you know, over to 50 times over and over and over. And eventually through time, you will have that muscle memory. You can just do it. So if you need to draw a right hand, you can just do it. You know, no. that, that, that's interesting. Cause when you said you said draw, draw 50 squares, I'm thinking, oh, he's teaching gridding. And then, no, no, no you're teaching draw it 50 times. Yeah, that's yeah. even better. You know, it's like it's like, you know, I, I am not a fan of gridding. I'll be honest. I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, all. But it's like drawing it 50 times. I'm a yeah. fan of that. You know, yeah. it's like, See, that, that, that's the same the same thing as uh, I always say, draw for the garbage can. In other words, don't be afraid to get everything perfect the first time. If, if you if you have to start over, start over and do it again because yeah. you will do it a little bit better, a little you bit better. Learn, you learn more from failure than yeah. you do from victory. I, I remember when I was training and, you know, I was hobby, you know, doing it for exercise, but I was, I was, my gym was a boxing gym. Yeah. And, and I remember boxing and, and, and um, you know, this, the guy that was training me was this, retired Marine. And he was this grizzled old guy. And, and he would basically just, you know, beat us all up because he was so good. You know, he had forgotten more about boxing than I would ever learn. Yeah. And, and I was just, you know, I was boxing to lower my cholesterol. That's what I was boxing for. But I really got into it. I loved it. And I remember, you know, when you're hitting the heavy bag, the heavy bag doesn't hit back. Right. Right. But, but a and, heavy human will. <laughs> and then, yeah, heavy human will. And he hit me because I wasn't, you know, you don't have to worry about keeping your hands up and your chin down when you're hitting a heavy bag. Yeah. And I thought I was doing good. And then, uh, you know, Mike Tyson said, everybody's got to plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So I, w I went in the ring with him and we were going to spar and yeah. I wasn't keeping my hands up. The fundamentals, the basics. Yeah. And he hit me dead in the face yeah. and rung my bell so bad. And I remember I, I mean, I was out, but I oh. fell forward like this wow. and my forehead landed on his <laughs> chest. Like, oh, and I'm like that's... my arms are dangling down and my head on his chest is the only thing keeping me vertical. And then he leans down and he goes, what did you do wrong? And yes. I said, I didn't keep Everything. my hands up. And he goes, what are you going to do next time? I'm going to keep my hands up. He goes, you all right? I'm like, give me a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was out. <laughs> right. But I learned. Weird? Hands weird? up, chin down. <laughs> Isn't it weird? It's all basics, you know? It, um, is. it doesn't matter but, what it is. You know, yeah. boxing, drawing, painting. Yeah. Fundamentals. Yeah. Except, then, 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 of course, the next level of after you get a painting, what do you do with it? You know, do you 
do you keep it or do you sell it? And why do you sell it? Are you trying to make a living? Are you just trying to pay for supplies? You know, most people that I talk to are eventually trying to make a living at it, you know, right. and that's the major hurdle that they have. You know, right. That, that well, let's people. talk about that because you just you just hit on something really cool, and this is this is where I love this show. Um, is you said selling the artwork may be just be to buy more supplies. Yeah, because you want to fund your hobby by selling it. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's like you can always want to be a hobbyist artist, and sure. never you have no expression. But if you can. Use that as a mini business. In other words, I'm going to sell this so that I could buy more paint supplies. Yeah. Or right. buy more, you know, expensive paint supplies or, you know what I mean? I want to start using professional grade paints or professional paint brushes right. or, or instead of painting on cheap canvases from uh, Hobby Lobby or Michaels, I want to get on, you know, linen or I want to get on, you know, wood panels or dye bond or whatever or copper plates, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. That's a great thing is to fund it by just selling artwork to fund your artwork yeah and to me that's a whole separate art form is selling it marketing is one thing selling is another you know but uh it's a great art form to learn and once you start learning it you really get into it and, and it's like it's you you never stop learning every single day you will learn something more about it but i think the key to that is loving people loving humanity liking people to to come in and talk to you you know and right a lot of people, that that's a that's a it's a big hurdle as well you know you got to right. get past that that anxiety of speaking to people that you don't know mm. and, that uh, you know that, that that's really good my uh, my friend matt tommy uh he talks about how people don't buy art because they need it they right, buy right. it because they want a connect they have a connection with the artist yes yes and and so you figured that out you, by saying you have to like people, you have to be there. So let's talk about your, when somebody walks into your booth, we're going to talk about the booth in just a second, but when somebody walks into your booth or a gallery that you own or however they're looking at your artwork, mm -hmm. how do you engage with that customer, that potential customer? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you take them from they're curious about your art. They may have never seen your art before in their life. Right. They walk in the door or they walk through the booth archway. Yeah. How do you engage them initially? And how do you take them from here to them walking out with a painting and you're holding a big wad of cash? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, through. I can, I can give you uh, first I'll give you the basic nutshell because I can literally, and I'm not kidding, talk to you about, Oh, about a month straight about this. However, let me give you the first thing first is what you never do, which I have seen this in restaurants, galleries, clothing, all of it. What you never do is say, can I help you? That's the kiss of death in sales. Can I help you? Because that automatically response is, no, I'm just looking. And that's it. Boom. You're finished. That's you. Now there's a wall between you and them. And I hear that all the time. When I, when I go to some place, whatever, they all say, can I help you? Or even other artists booths that don't know who I am, they'll say, can I help you? I'm like, nah, I'm just, <laughs> just looking. <laughs> right, I'm looking at the competition. Yeah, I'm checking out the competition. Yeah, it's like, it's like that's, that's called the sales prevention department. And oh, that, man, this is so good. This is so good already. I hope yeah, you guys are right. Take notes. Take notes. Right. Right. And that, these are all things that uh, that can absolutely kill a sale. The second way is to sit in your don't talk to me chair, I call it. Oh, have, I a, have, a book. Call that. Yeah, have a book in front of you and never raise your head from that book. You know, just expect people to walk up to the painting, take it off the wall, bring it to you, throw some cash on your lap and walk away. It, it I mean, it may happen once in your lifetime. I don't know, mm -hmm. but uh, right because it's all about. Sometimes it's all about posture and body language. Yes, absolutely. If you look yeah. like you, if you look like they're bothering you or interrupting oh, you, you another know. wall. Yeah, yeah, another wall comes up. You know, man. Uh, but and also, uh, you would you would never say or or tell them to buy this or tell them how great it is or tell them. 
anything about it really at first because the key or the, the rule number one is when you're talking, you're pushing. And when you're asking, you're pulling. So the whole point of sales, especially in larger ticket items or even, even smaller ticket items, you know, is questions. You have to question the person and let them answer and listen intently on everything they say. So what how they say questions are you, would you ask to well, start the conversation? Yeah, the first question is, uh, uh, first you'd say, well, have you seen my work before? Oh, um, that's a good one. If, if they've seen your work before, they'll, they'll tell you, I saw it here, I saw it there. Oh, wow, I, I do remember that. You know, what did you feel about it then? Or if, if, they're, if they're walking around, the, the object is to step back because it's called touching. Touch one is the greeting. You know, good morning, I'm Patrick Reynolds. By the way, uh, have you seen the work before? That's touch number one. Mm -hmm. uh, then touch number two is as they're walking around and they know that you're, they've, you've, they've broken the ice, they, they know what you sound like, they, they, they know you're not going to attack them. They'll walk around and you got to let them land on something. And when they land, mm -hmm. then I walk towards them slowly. And at that point, I never stand between them and the painting because you're not the obstacle. You know, the obstacle is in their own mind. So I always stand next to them and try as intently as I can. This is another weird secret is uh, I try to stand like they stand and stand Body next to them. Body language, yes. And it, 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 geese, it, 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 geese. it actually goes to the point to where you can almost watch their breathing. If you can breathe the same rate that they breathe, there's a strange connection there. And they don't understand no, why they like you so much. That, you know, that, that's funny. I have read so many things and I've watched videos on that and I've yeah. used it uh, before um, in relationships. Men yeah. do this. If you watch men, especially men get in a group and you're, you're standing in a circle talking and you will see one of them cross their arms. And they all cross their arms. They yeah. all cross their arms. Yeah. And then they'll sit. One of them will do this. Then they'll all start doing that. Yep. Or they'll stand yep. with their hands on their hips. They'll also, do, and you can quickly find out who that alpha male is in yeah. the group because they'll all mimic his body language. Yes. And well, so what you're saying is, is that you are coming alongside the person and you're, and you're, and you're mimicking their body language, which and, creates a connection, a, a subconscious connection right. with and that. They're, and they're the alpha, not you. Right. So you're putting them in charge of the sale. Yeah. So when you're dancing with a customer, always let them lead, you know. Nice. So, so as they're leading, you, your job at that point is called neuro-linguistic programming, which is oh. <laughs> it, it's, it's just things that you just study, you know, and it, uh -huh. sounds, it sounds guruish and spooky, but it's, it's, it's the real deal. Um, like, for instance, when, when guys like you were talking about fold their arms, you know, and, and other guys follow their arms. You know, that is a very kinesthetic thing that guys, you know, can feel and so forth. So they, they're, they're, they're folding their arms in, con in congruency to the person talking. So they, they want right. to be a part of the conversation. Right, they right. Be the outsider. Right. Uh, so when you're, when you're talking to somebody, you have to place them in a group. And I try to do this early on. Uh, there's three types of people as, as far as this type of, of, a, of a column you place them in. There's, uh, there's visual, audio, and kinesthetic types of people. Mm -hmm. The uh, visuals are the people that everything is visual to them. They want to see it only, and anything else is, is just noise. Uh, then there's the, the, the audio types. They want to hear about it, want to hear everything you have to say about it. And the kinesthetic types, they want to hold it, feel it, see what it weighs, and see how, what, it's, what it's made of and how you make it, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So they got, you got those three types of people. And if you can somehow, which it takes a little while to figure it out, is figure out, for instance, if they are a kinesthetic type person and you can see it as you're talking to them, you, you look at the piece and very slowly and, and softly I ask, so what do you feel grabs you most about that piece? Because now they're grabbing it, you know, because they're kinesthetic. They want to grab it. And I'll, I'll pull it off the wall and I'll... Asking to hold it for a second as I adjust a light or something. So now they're holding it. 
So I'll right. take, take it back away from them, place it, and let them see the, the piece in a different lighting. Or it's kind of like taking it. the car for the test drive. Right. That's for the kinesthetic. You know, and then for the for the audio, you know, I'd ask them, can you you can almost hear the leaves rustling in the background, can't you? You know, and you can almost tell if, if you're connecting, they say, Yeah, yeah, I actually can. That's that is so amazing. Or if if it's if they're just visual, then you hold it there and say, Wait a minute, what do you see when you look at this area here? What do you see when you back up? Do you do you see a difference? You know, you're using these words of see and feel and hear and all that. And you're making a deeper, deeper connection with them. And the whole time you were slowly, slowly talking softer and softer and softer. And not that it's hypnotic, but it's very relaxing. You see, right. you're, so you're not making it, ease. Yeah. You're not, you're not making it to where you're trying to shout them into a sale, you know? And so now you've, you've got them looking at the piece. They love it. And it said, now, if you were to purchase, if you were to own this piece right here, where do you feel you would hang it in your home? And then they're visualizing where it's going to be in their house. I, I, I like what you just said there because you didn't say, you, you stopped yourself. You said, you started by saying if you were to purchase this, but then you yeah, stopped. It, and you said, yeah, if you were to yeah. own this yeah, piece, right. where they would purchase you know, they So yeah. at no point are you, in, you haven't even touched on buying it right if, it, right if you were to own this so that would almost imply you could be giving it to them at this point right they don't know so they're just imagining if this was where are you going to put it in your home so that yeah. that's so powerful guys let me tell you what this is gold this is podcast gold right now you need to get your <laughs> friends to watch this video and watch the replay i am not playing yeah. with you Pay attention. I'm taking ferocious notes. I hope you are too. So going on, on that. So you've got them now and you're talking about if they were to own this piece. Yeah. And now I'm placing the art in their home, in their mind. Right. And first thing, first you got to figure out where they're going to hang it. And then one step deeper is ask them, who do you feel you would show first that comes into your home? Oh, wow. You that <laughs> so then, it take, then, it, then they have time. That it's in the home. They, 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 they can see people coming in their house and looking at it and them talking about it. And that's also really, really golden. But then you have a the, the next hurdle is if it's if it's the wife, you have to sometimes resell to the husband. So I don't go into price or all those things until I know for sure the husband's not having to make the decision. Is he on his way or something like that? Right. So, so once you find out that all the decision makers are there, then you can start uh, showing them around and see where they're landing. And if they still come back to that same piece, uh, I still uh, don't go into the sale unless they start asking. So how much is something like this? Because I do not. You know, this is questionable. And I've tried it both ways for years and years and years. I don't put price tags available out front because that's a that's a very analytical thing it's numbers and i'm trying to get them out of analytical getting strictly into emotion so right. so if they ask well how much is something like this and I, I build the tension by saying that's a fascinating question now why do you ask about this particular piece well because blah 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 you know then i tell them again ask asking them what do you see in this that, that you that really drew you to it. Like, why this? Why that? Blah, blah, blah. Right. And then I'll finally give in and give them the price. And it's only just a matter of moments that I'll pull the, the ticket that is hanging from the back of the painting out front to justify what I'm about to say about the price. I'm not just making a price up, in other words. I'll pull it out, show them the price, and I'll tuck it right back down, right, right behind it. So now they, they kind of know the price and know where it is. And now they're like, hmm, I can actually own this. This is in my price range. Now, I, I do this before I even go to the show, you know, because I try to make the pieces where I can sell a decent volume of work without uh, trying to make all of my money on one on one sale. In other mm -hmm. words, uh, you can't go there with all $10,000 pieces and uh, you, you may miss, you know, so. If, if you go in there with that $500, that $1,000, $1,500, you 
you'll do fine because people tend to go to art shows. If they're going to buy something, they kind of expect that, you know, right. uh, for, for a decent piece of art, you it's know, right. and, 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 and you can go up to 3,500, 45 in, the, in that range. Uh, but it depends on the size and you can, you can tell where they're at by what size they're looking at, you know? So I'll, right. I'll, I'll show them the price, let them glance at it, tuck it behind there. And then they're like, Hmm, I don't, I don't know. I'm, uh, then, then I'll stop it right there. I'll stop everything. Like putting the brakes on a train, stop. Mm -hmm. Then I say, wait a minute, I got to show you this. <laughs> and and I, it, it works like a charm. I have a piece usually tucked behind my wall somewhere. Uh huh. And I'll pull it out and show them this, this new piece uh, that kind of goes with the one that they're looking at. And I place them side by side. I said, now, these look really great together. I just wanted to ask you your opinion. Which direction do you feel you would go if you had to get one of these? Which, which, which direction do you feel would be the best direction? Well, it doesn't matter what they say because I have a third piece that I pull out. So now I have a triptych sitting out on the floor, leaning against the wall, very, very informal. And now they're looking at three pieces. So now if they just pick one, Eh, it's just one, you know, I could have right. bought all three, but I just bought one. So anyhow, uh, so as I'm doing this, I'm also selling to other people that are gathering around. And that's when I speak a little louder so others can hear what I'm saying. Right. And now you're, now you're, you're drawing a crowd. Now you're drawing a crowd, you know, so if you can get the crowd and get others to like it and others to, to have their approval, their endorsement then the buyer, the person that wants to buy it, sees that other people like it, so it must be the right one. And and without even saying anything, if I can sense that they just want the one and that's it, mm -hmm. then I can I can go to a semi-closing where I grab the piece and I bring it to my closing station. I call it my closing station. It's a little, it's a little uh, box thing. It's a little tower box that I have my iPad and whatnot. But it's in, out in plain view. Everybody can see it. Right. And I bring it over there and I set it down and I just open up the iPad and I just ask them, so do you normally do the cash or the other the card? What, what do you normally do? Uh, and well, it would have to be a card, I guess, if I was going to do it. So I knew then it's, it is, it's done. It's a sold yeah, deal. Kind of sold so, deal. But then there's that fork in the road, you know, prior, prior to that, they'll, I don't know. I, I would say, seven times out of 10 that ask, well, what's your best price on this? You know, and right, they're is, trying to get you to go down. They're trying to barter yeah, you at that point, which to a lot of artists, it's insulting. But to me, that is, that's gold because once they ask what the best price is, you know, the interest is there. They want to own it. They right. just want to make sure they're getting the best price known, you know? And so I'll always tell them, I said, man, I, I really appreciate that question. I would love to just give it to you. I would love for you to just have it, you know, because it's not about the money for me. I want you to own this great piece that you love because I don't want you to have it unless you absolutely love it. I said, but my work through the years has gone up in value and it never goes down. So you can rest assured that the next person that comes along, they're not getting any better deal than you would ever get because I, I just I don't really alter on the prices. I try to make it towards dead on. And if you love it, then you should own it. But if you don't love it, maybe you should walk around a little bit, you know, and see if the piece stays in your mind. Now you've taken the power out from under them. They don't have the negotiating power anymore. Right. You told them to go take a walk somewhere. If you don't love it, then go take a walk. You know what I mean? So, right. so, so right. now they don't feel like they're, they're dealing with a desperate artist that needs to make a dollar. Right. Know? So and you didn't lower your price. No, you know, you never have to, you know, and then, then they'll say, well, can, that, can you at least help me on the tax, take the tax off? I said, well, I'd love to do that as well. I really would. However, I'm a licensed Florida dealer and I, I just can't break the law like that. You know, boom, that's it. That's all they wanted to hear. Yeah. And, okay. I understand, you know, and right. hell, now you're alive. How do you say? How do you say? Oh no! Go ahead and break the law. Shh. You know they yeah, right. didn't say that. No, because I've already told them to. Maybe you should walk around. 
they already know that I'm not desperate for the sale. Right. So now they have to have it because the more you deny, the more mm-hmm. they want. They have to have it now, you know. Right. And, uh, some sometimes I will uh, tell them up front, you know, if they make this this crazy offer of half off, you know. So well, let, let me show you something smaller, you know, something within that price range, and then I build them right back up again. Right, because they really want that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They're just trying to negotiate you down. And it's like, yeah, though that's a huge, you know, I, I think that's a huge mistake that a lot of artists make. You know, two two mistakes is, A, they don't price their artwork the right way. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, you and I have talked about it before. You know, it's like it's like at a zero. I dare you. And um, see yeah. what happens. And then the other side of that is you know, they're just, they're they're underselling themselves to the point of just ridiculous. There's that fine line between you've priced it too much where no one will buy it. And you priced it too low where you're, it's not worth your time and effort to, to, you know what I mean? You're not making any money off of it. Exactly. You know, because, you know, there's rarely enough volume at a lot of these art shows to where if you're selling things really, really inexpensive, you're never going to, you'll make sales, but you won't sell the volume of cheaper things that would give you the margin or the profit that you would need to get out of that show with a good, a good uh, amount of money where you can continue to do another show. Yeah. Tell, tell us a story. Uh, you told me yesterday uh, when we were talking about um, a young man, an, an artist friend of yours, who was just starting out and you told him to add a zero. Tell yeah. us, I'm going to full screen you. I want you to tell us that story while I full screen you, because this is just too good. And I think yeah. it goes into the whole, how to sell art, but also how to not undersell yourself. Mm-hmm. And so, go ahead, I'm going to full screen you, well, and then you go ahead. You go right ahead here. Uh, this was a, a good friend of mine who is an absolutely fantastic painter. I mean, he's he's brilliant, and I've known him for a long time. And we had always talked about sales. You know, for years and years, we 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 both had libraries about sales, and he was kind of starting out. And he was kind of on the timid side about pricing because he he didn't want to leave the show with no money. And so he had these beautiful pieces. Uh, a lot of them were twelve hundred dollars. And I looked at that like, wow, that is a fantastic piece. It was like 40 by 60. It was big. And I said, I tell you what, uh, I'm going to make a wager with you. And I said, what do you mean? I said, I want you to add another zero behind that $1,200 piece and see what happens. He said, Pat, I can't do that because I have to feed my family. This isn't a hobby for me. I, I, I have to leave the show with sales. I said, well, I tell you what, just with this particular one piece, add the zero. And if it doesn't sell, I'll, I'll buy you a steak dinner. We'll do whatever. I said, but I can guarantee you we're going to get a lot more attention with that. And so he very nervously added the zero. Well, so I went back to my place and, uh, and, and I got the phone call. I said, Pat, you're not going to believe it. I have to deliver it tonight. And I see, I told you, he sold it for $12,000. And, and there was no offer, no anything. Of course, he had to deliver it. And I was very, very proud. But it was that difference. If it were 1200 he probably would not have sold it. But at the twelve thousand range, the the value was there in the numbers, and these people uh, were just looking for something that was a, a a big anchor piece behind their couch, and they want to be able to talk to their friends. This is a twelve thousand dollar original that I have, and it makes all the difference. And these people are still happy today. In fact, they've they've purchased other pieces from him as well, and that's, that's a lifelong relationship that he'll have. And from that point forward, he always adjusted his prices. And uh, we, we call each other a lot and critique each other a lot. And we don't hold back anything. Uh, in fact, if I, if I finish something, first first of all, I have my wife look at it and she critiques me, see how much it should be uh, be priced at. And sometimes she'll just tell me outright, you should just not even bring that one. It's, it's not, it doesn't belong, it doesn't belong. Or I'll ask my buddies, you know, what do you think about this? And they're like, hmm, are you happy with that? I knew then. Okay, I, I got to leave this one home. So I'm always painting for the garbage can. I'm, I'm painting for the fact that uh, 
it's it's probably not going to work, you know, rather than fixing it, I'm just going to redo it again completely. And I'm shooting for prices before I even start the painting. Uh, I know this is going to be, it's probably going to sell for a thousand bucks. or this is going to probably sell for 1500 or 2000 or whatever, 5,000, whatever it is. So I'm, I'm pricing it before I even paint it, you know? So I kind of know the direction it's going by the time I finish with it. So how do you, how do you price your artwork when you, when you're going into a piece, um, how do you know this one's going to be say $1,200 and this one's going to be $12,000? Yeah. What yeah. is the determining factor? Is it size? Is it um, content? What What is it that, that makes a painting go from this price to this price for you? Yeah. Uh, there is a combination of size and content. And what I try to do is the pieces that I put a lot more effort in, I try to build a story into the art to where if I can leave them at that painting for three minutes or so, Mm -hmm. then it's the, the likelihood that it's going to sell is much higher than uh, a piece that I paint that has no real story. It's just a decorative, more decorative piece. And if you can just say, I like the colors or whatever, but if it has a true story in it, then I, I can usually price it where, where it, it makes more and more sense for them to buy it because they, uh, they can't walk away. You know, it's, it's not just, I'm, I'm going to go walk around the show for a little bit, but if you have that story that they can connect with, then mm -hmm. they've already taken that step into the realm of ownership, you know, right. but that's why I have prices behind the painting. Cause I don't want them to start looking around and trying to find just something, the price. you know? So uh, I always tell people, you know, I said, I am by no means the, the cheapest uh, artist here. There are a lot of people. You can get some great bargains, I'm sure. And I encourage you to go look, look at that, you know, but come back and see me because I really want to talk to you about something, you know, anyhow. Uh, so when they come back, if they do come back, it's, it's, it's in the bag, you know, but uh, there are certain paintings that I always build the story of life into the painting itself. Mm. Like I have, I have a, a couple of my pieces that have roses with petals falling down mm -hmm. and there's 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 deeper meaning the, the the rose is life itself and the the petals are the days falling away you know and in these days you can't get back you can't put the petals back in the rose all right once once it once that once that petal is gone it's gone make sure that petal makes makes a difference right well let's take a look at some of your artwork while i've got you on that subject yep. here's a, one of the pieces that you sent me uh, i just love it i just love it um take a look at this one tell us about that one uh, that one is, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of an unusual piece. It was about a uh, self-examination mm. and it's, 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 uh, it's about the, the inner secrets that we, that we keep inside of us. It's called garden of secrets, the name of it. Okay. Anyway, um, uh, it's about the secrets that we hold within us and secrets of our past, whether it be something that was, that was terrible that happened to you, hard, difficult times, happy times, great times, wow. great friends, whatever. Uh, now, all of these things uh, come up to what makes you who you are. It, it builds your personality. But at the same time, it builds your inner strength because the world is full of chaos. You know, every day is just filled with chaos and stress. People think that, man, my life is so stressful. They don't realize everybody's life is very, very stressful. Uh, but it's that stress, those hard times that give you that, that strength to continue on and do it well, you know? And so I always say, these are, these are secrets, but later on in life, you realize they were never secrets. These are just building blocks. These are all things that you thought you were hiding from others, but they can see it in your eyes. They, they can see it, that you're a strong person. You, you've been through some, some really serious things and they can trust you because you've been there. Right. You know? And I, I love that. You've got such a impasto uh, textures to to your artwork. Here's another one um, that is just gorgeous as well. And I love I love your just the way that you do things. And, and you do a combination of things. Uh, you use uh, charcoal, graphite, and and oil paints at yes. the same time. Is that correct? I start I start the whole thing off with uh, vine charcoal, and I use the side of the of the of the charcoal to where it's a really wide. Uh, <laughs> Uh, line that, I, that I'm putting on there. Sure. And, and I kind of 
do the whole thing in circles. The, the whole painting, all of my paintings start off in big, big circles. So you'll find out where, where the leg is, uh, where the where the back arches. That's a big circle. You know, the, the where, where the knees, the, the hands. That's all based on circles. And and there, this one has the rose in it. And she's sitting on a cliff. All of my my pieces where they're sitting on a cliff is that dire decision that we make in life. Because if you kind of make the wrong decision, you're going to fall off the cliff, and you're not going to realize where 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 was that wrong turn. You know. So this this decision was. She's holding that rose, and the and the, the days are falling away. The petals are falling away, and she's deciding right then that today is the day I'm going to be happy. It's not tomorrow. It's not after I purchase this one thing I'll be happy only then. Um, happiness is in the journey of getting somewhere. You know, it's it's right now. It's 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 happening to you right now. But but you can decide whether it's happiness or not happiness. You know. So my grandfather told me this when I was young. He said, you know, uh, Pat, nothing in life has any meaning except for the meaning you give it. And mm -hmm. that really stuck with me. I didn't realize what he was saying when I was young. And then when I got older, I realized, wow, you know, that, that is so true. Because nothing really has meaning, you know, uh, in itself. But you, can, but you can label it as this is fun. I love right. this type of thing. You know, uh, whereas even... If, if let's just say if you're in a sporting event and you're a you're a track and field runner, there's a big difference from you are running in a race or running away from somebody with a knife. You know, right. uh, it's one's hilariously fun and one is frightening. You know, right? But, yeah, exactly. You probably run a lot faster too in one of them. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but but it's the same action, just different meaning. It's your you're right. applying. So. Right. Yeah, and if they were to time people running away from grizzly bears, I bet you there would be some land speed records. Right, absolutely. Yeah, there's a different <laughs> meaning you're giving it right there, but it's the same thing. Uh, so I, I always told my daughters, you know, when, when they're growing up uh, as, as youngsters, I'd always lecture them, oh gosh, just about every day. I would lecture both my daughters and their friends. And when they come over, I'd sit them all at the table and we'd talk. We'd all talk about all sorts of things. And my wife always thought that I was... Uh, running my daughter's friends out of the house, and but you know, they, all, they all came back, you know, and, and wanted to hear more about what we talked about, and we talked about everything about, you know, how life is. It seems like it's hard. It seems like it's going to be hard, but try to embrace everything that happens to you. Embrace it, and analyze it, and go through go through it, you know. And I taught them to uh, have columns on a piece of paper how things that you want out of life and then things you don't want out of life. And you will, you'll start to gravitate towards the things that you have. Oh, a target. Yeah, write it down, make a yeah. plan and work the plan. You and that goes with, with anything in life, but yeah, it is, yeah. it's hard, but yeah. you know, there are ways to, you know, to, to do that. And I love how your paintings express those themes you yes. know, and, and that's the thing when you create an when you create a piece of art that resonates with yeah. people yeah. on a on an emotional, visceral level, mm -hmm. you will never have a problem selling it. Right. It's, you it's just not to connect the right person to that painting. Yeah. 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 And so and you, you will be surprised if you have a story that they can relate to uh, with, within, within the piece. Uh, suddenly it's more than art to them. You know, it, it's, it's a piece of themselves that they're right. purchasing. That they, they just, it was a piece that was missing of them that they found. Right. And, and that's the thing. When they, when you did what you just said, a missing piece of themselves that they found, this yeah. is now a way for them to express to the world mm -hmm. that piece of them. Yes. And so when they're hanging it behind their couch, like your friend's painting, yep. and they have this piece, they bring their friends over and they show them the painting. This is an original piece of art that, you know, however much they paid for it, it doesn't matter how much they paid for it because right. that is a piece that they can show their friends and right. their loved ones and say, that is a chunk of this. Yep. Yep. And yeah. that's a chunk of my soul, my life, my meaning, my my everything that's me. This yeah. is a way for me to show you that part of me. Price is meaningless to them at that point because right. they have that thing. And, and yeah. that's the power of 
you figured out this artwork will do that for somebody. Yeah. And when that person walks around my, my, my booth or my gallery and they walk up to that painting, you've learned to recognize that moment where they make that connection with your art. And that's when you come in and you start to work yeah. the sale. And yeah. then boom, the sale's there. The sale isn't even hard to do. Yeah. Because yeah. you found a way to strengthen the bond of their initial reaction to your painting. Yes. Yeah. And I think and that's the, I think that's the biggest key to your success as a salesman is you recognize when someone makes an emotional connection and then you are able with your, with your methodology to reinforce and strengthen that bond that they have to that piece of art where they yeah. can't leave without it. Indeed. You know, and I, that, I, I, I told you before, uh, I, I kind of began my, my journey in sales and things like that a long, long time ago while I was in Italy. And I went to a suit shop that sold uh, Armani suits. And I, back in those days, I thought, man, that's the Holy Grail. I'd love to go just look at that, just see what it right. looks like. I walked inside. It was a gorgeous place. It was absolutely beautiful. It was three stories tall. It had great suits just hanging kind of sporadically on, on shelves or facing you or mannequins, whatever. And there were only two older gentlemen that worked there, both dressed fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, if you're in an Armani suit, you better look good. Yeah, and they did. And But there were <laughs> older guys with the silver hair, you know, and they immediately tagged me as American. Immediately. They knew exactly who I was, you know, or, or right. what, I, what I was, you know. So they, they, come, they, they walked down the stairs, and one of them made the first touch. You know, it says, greetings, sir. Uh, I want you to look around and I want you to fall in love with these suits. And when you find one, I want you to, to, to put it on and feel what, what, it, what a suit feels like as opposed to what it looks like. You know, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of looking around. I said, why do you do that? Just look around, you know, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back later on. I'm going to get me a coffee. So he walked off with a great excuse. He's going to be going to get coffee so I can relax. So I'm walking around this place, not even knowing what I'm looking at. And I knew nothing about suits. So, right. uh, so, but I noticed that it wasn't like at uh, Dillard's or Sears, you know, the suits there where they have 500 suits hanging up on one rack. Uh, they had like one here and one there and one over there, you know, but it was very well displayed. So I was looking at these dark color, you know, the black pants and the black jacket, you know, and whatnot. And, he walked up to me and he says, I have your size and I want you to just see what you think about this, you know? And so he went in the back and got, he already knew my size. He pulled out this jacket with, he two, enough, he knew. with two other jackets. So he laid three jackets on the floor and he said, no, if I were you, I would wear this one more in the spring. And this one here is more of a winter type feeling uh, this one over here is for formal. It's a formal wear. And he, he walked over and got three pairs of pants that would match the jackets and placed those on the floor next to the jackets. And he had a, a tie rack thing where he had about five or six really nice looking ties. And he tied the tie knot, which I can't do it while it's wrapped around my neck. He did, he did it with one hand. On his hand, he did the perfect wow. tie <laughs> right there on his hand and laid it down next to the jacket. And he said, now, normally when you have a suit, you're going to need like four or five shirts to go with that suit because you, the, the, the shirt sometimes makes the suit. So he, he pulled out four or five shirts and tucked them just behind the jacket of each one. And then he had cufflinks that he, that he reached behind the counter and threw the cufflinks next to the shirt. I'm like, my gosh, that, that looks really really fantastic when you put it all together you know yeah. it's not just a suit anymore he said but but you got to finish it off he said here's the socks that would go with that shirt and he had the the all, all the socks that matches the shirts exactly you know so i'm thinking wow that is just fabulous he says no 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 that's nothing that is nothing you're just looking at it i want you to feel it it just just Put this one here on. Put it on, yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll have everything waiting for you in the dressing room. I didn't touch anything, neither did he. He had somebody pick up pick up that suit, put it in the dressing room, ready to go. And so just put it on. That way you can tell your friends 
that you tried it on and how you felt about it, you know? So yeah, sure. Why not? I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. You know, what do I have to lose? Uh, I went in there and I tried this thing on and, and he was right. You know, I felt like I suddenly stepped up in society, you know, I was, <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm part of society, you know, and, and, I, I, and he, and he immediately said, I think I was right. I was right. I knew I was right. And, and, but of course the pants fit exact, the shirt fit exact. And it was just magnificent. You know, I said, well, I, I do love it. I really do. But I tell you, I, there's no way I can afford this. Not, not even a shot. He said, I know, I knew you were going to say something like that. He said, because you can't afford it. Uh, just piece by piece. You know, you don't have to buy it all at one time. I don't want you to come in here and go broke. He says, but I want you to try on this other suit just for me. Just put, put this other one on and see how this one feels. Before long, I had tried on all three suits. Ah. Out, and he is tell, telling me how great this is and that is. Try on this shirt. Put on these cuff links. Try this tie on mm -hmm. that tie. And sometimes without a tie, how you would wear it without a tie. Uh, and I was, I was just so part of that experience. At that point, I left with a pair of pants and a shirt. I didn't buy the jacket, but I bought the pants and the shirt. And I was, it was now it was just an embarrassing amount of money, you know, that I paid for that, but I felt so good about it. There was no buyer's remorse, you know, right. you just felt good about it because this guy was so fantastic at what he did. He really cared. I mean, right. he really cared. You could tell he wasn't trying to sell me anything. He just wanted me to try it on and, and just get the experience. He believed, believed in the, his product so 100%. That he knew that you would you, you would just love it. And I love the fact that he didn't try to have you what, what he said. You know, I don't want you to go broke here. You don't have to buy the whole suit. You yeah. buy it piece by piece and work your way to a full suit. Yeah. He wanted a customer. He, he wanted a lifelong customer. He wanted, he, he, he wanted me to buy things. And I this was over 35 years ago. And I remember it like it was yesterday because it was such a great experience. It's a big question. Do you still fit in those pants? Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, for a long time, not a chance. Not yeah. a chance. I couldn't even get the first button near, you know, I, I could, I, uh, anyhow. Uh, <laughs> but. Lately, me and my wife have been trying to stay healthy and we've been uh, walking for about six or eight miles a day. And mm -hmm. it is amazing what that can do to you for its health. Yes. And now I can I can slip into a wardrobe that I didn't realize I could I could wear anymore. And I'm glad I didn't throw all that stuff away. Nice. Yeah. Especially with, with an Armani suit. I mean, that's a big well, deal. So, yeah, that's a, great, that's a great point about, you know, just how he sold you and what you learned from the yes. way that he sold those pants to you and that shirt to you. Yes. You he was taught that an education. He was educating me not only on the suit, how it should feel, how it should fit, but he was, show, he was telling me, why does this color go with this color? Why does this shirt go with these pants? He said, if you notice, the pants are warm gray. He says, I have pants over here that are cool gray. And I have these, these, black, these black trousers are warm black. You know, these are cooler black. You know, and that's why mm -hmm. I chose this warmer shirt to go with this warm black. Because lots of people don't understand why that it doesn't match. Because you sometimes have a warm shirt and cool pants. You know, uh, right. and so and he, he, he kind of showed me the, the, the insider uh, ways of looking at go. fine suits like that. that that's and, amazing. You know, at, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you're selling. It's yeah. how you sell it, whether yeah. it's an Armani. And really, you could say an Armani suit is a piece of art. Yes, indeed. You know, craftsmanship yeah. involved. And so he is really selling art. You know, yes. and, um, he was, and, he cared, and he and he he a he cared. He looked me in the eye. He listened to everything I said. Uh, and I said a lot. And he, he kind of almost repeated back to me in his own way what I said to him. And he, then he asked questions based on that. Right. And so he was pulling instead of pushing, as you said, the early whole time. He pulled me all the way through the sale. All right. And, you know, it's uh, like, if you, you know, when you got a fish on the line for, you, for those that fish out there, 
Yeah. You don't want to, you want to let the drag out. Sometimes you got to let yeah. that run, you know, yeah. because if you don't, you're going to snap the line. Right. Right. And, exactly. and you know, it's, exactly. it, it's so funny because I, a couple of months ago I had a class uh, full of uh, hobbyist artists and um, we we're talking about selling art. And, you know, I, I, I took it as a badge of honor. They called me a sellout artist. Yeah. Because yeah. I sold my art. I hear that all the time. And it's but, like, but, and I'm like, here, here's someone that's never sold a piece of art in their life and, and works as, you know, I, I can't remember what they did for a living, but it was like, they were like, you shouldn't sell your art. You shouldn't want be caring about that. You know, so it's, oh, okay. So I'm not a real artist unless I'm a starving artist. And it was like, course. I took it as a badge of honor. Like I finally, I came home, told my wife, I got called a sellout today because yeah. I sell yeah. art. It's like, it was silly. But you know, at the end of the day, it's like, I get to make my living yeah. painting pictures all day. And that's the difference right there. If yep. you ask somebody who says you're a sellout, if you ask them, well, well, what do you do for a living? Well, I work at this restaurant or whatever. Well, that's fascinating. Why don't you why don't you paint for a living? If you're so passionate about art, why don't you do it for a living? That so who's a sellout? Yeah. You know, you, you you only paint sometimes, but so you must not be totally passionate about it. Right, you're right, time. exactly. You know, but and then there's the, you know, there's the whole thing where it's like, um, you know, what do you do for a living? I work at in this place. Okay, well, why don't you do that for free? Right. Yeah. You're a sellout. Yeah. You're, you know, if you really loved what you do, you wouldn't need to get paid to do it. So right. you're, you know, it was one of those things. It's, it's it's always funny the way people treat artists versus other other fields. Yeah. Where you have a job, you know, and and, and that's the thing. It's like people don't realize that this is my job. This is oh. your job, and part of the job is sales. And I don't care what it is. I mean, there are whole seminars on how to sell, whether you're selling cars, you're selling real estate, you're selling Armani suits, you're mm -hmm. selling art. It doesn't matter. Art is its, I mean, sales is its own art form in many ways. And it's a yeah. skill that you need to develop and learn. So let, let's transition now to talk about these. This is your booth or one photo of your booth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Here's, here's it from an outside view on the street. Let me hide this one and call up this one. So we can start on the outside of yeah. your booth. This is, this is like, so you're at an art festival. Yeah. First of all, explain what the heck is an art festival and how do they work and, and that kind of thing. And then I'll have a few questions for you about like, how do we, like if I wanted to have selling if i wanted to go to an art festival as an artist and sell my art in an art festival what would i need to have mm -hmm. like what, what equipment tent you know all that so what do i need what's the initial investment you know uh things like that you know what does it take to be at an art festival just to get in yeah and then yeah. we could talk about other, other things from that but explain first what yeah. an art festival is well these these art art shows art festivals there's two different types. There's a craft show and then there's an art show. The The craft show is more for people uh, selling wind chimes and cheaper items, but they still make a fortune, but they're just cheaper items. And people go to those particular craft shows expecting to spend so much money, like uh, $10, 15 $20. Then there's a fine art shows where everybody at the show, they're, they're trying to have a cohesive pricing where you, you're going to expect to spend 100 and up you know, on average, you know, 100, 500, 000, in that range, people mm -hmm. come there prepared to spend a different amount of money than they would at a craft. Right. Show. But, but the, the artist has to really have his game on, you know? So uh, what I, what I have right here is essentially uh, my, my booth is all single hung. I, I have one, one row of art. I don't have multiple pieces. And that's kind of what me and me and my buddies kind of uh, talk about is that if you have an art, booth like this and you have uh different sizes or different uh different subject matters you have a 57 chevy then you have a picture of a flower then you have a painting you know of a of a of a stall some are super tight some are photorealistic if you have them all in one booth it's very confusing because the person walking into your, into your booth they don't know who you are they don't know so what style are you mastering where where is this going you right. Know, Who are you as an artist? And that goes into what I, I tell 
everybody on this podcast, we say it all the time here. I tell my students all the time is you have to find your artistic voice. Yeah. Who yeah. are you as an artist? What do you paint? You know, yeah. uh, you yeah. want people to see a piece of art and and know it's you. And not exactly. from, from across a football field. All, all right. about it, I tell people, if you get right up on it about five inches away, it's disgusting looking. It looks like you just gobbed the paint on a piece of canvas. It looks terrible. But when you step back 10 feet or so, your mind puts it all together. And right. that's when you say, oh, that's a Reynolds. Isn't that right? Crazy? Right. You know? There's the Reynolds. There's a Gagno. There's yeah. Zorro. So there's so and so, and that's what you want to have. So when they walk up to your booth and they see this, I'm going to solo this. When they when they see so they this, know who it is. They know exactly. It. Oh, there's there's Reynolds booth right there. Uh, now for the for the artist just getting into this world, uh, I have to say art shows are a gift from God because now you have uh, a bunch of artists who get together and create a show that looks really, really fantastic. Most artists really take care of their, their, their surroundings, make it displayed very, very well. And now, if you have a promoter of the show that advertises the show extremely well, or, if, or the show's been around for years and years and years, you're going to have a clientele that's built in that's going to come to that show and look for either certain artists or look for just a new artist. But they're not looking for craft. They're not looking for uh, for shoes or whatever. They're there to shop for something for their home, something that they feel they have a connection with. So if you're just starting out and you want to get into an art show, which I would highly recommend, you have to, A, have a great camera or a decent enough camera to take some fantastic photos of your, of your work. And I always say, Get your own camera and learn to use it very, very well and and take lots and lots and lots of photos of your work. Yes, that's great. And for those of you that are watching and you're wanting to do that, we actually have a three part video on uh, the Ganyo Atelier YouTube channel, how to photograph your artwork yes. that, where we talk to a professional photographer. Wow. How to photograph your artwork, how all the buttons and dials on your camera, what they're for and how they work. And then I bring you into Photoshop and even teach you how to color correct and edit the picture. Um, so so we have a three, three video. Um, yeah, three, three YouTube videos that are all connected. Part one, part two, part three. Yep. How to hang it on your wall to photograph it, how to set up a light kit. Yep. All the way to how to do the photographing and then also how to edit it in, in a program like Photoshop. So that is so valuable because when I first started, there was no YouTube. There was no all, all there was no internet period. And uh, it, 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 it's fun aging yourself. <laughs> uh, it, had, it had film cameras. So you didn't even know what you took a photograph of until you've developed it, you know, right. Or bad. right. Nowadays you have digital, you know exactly what you got the second you pull the trigger. You right. Know? So a, you want to photograph your work. And, and make sure the piece is very clear and, 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 and cropped off perfectly. But then you want to bring it into a thumbnail. Bring all of your pieces into a thumbnail size. And, and see where your eye goes. See which piece is the most eye-catching as a thumbnail. Because now you're, you're going to send the art shows those pieces because the, juror, the jurors, the people who are jurying you into the show, Right. The guys that are making the decision whether or not they're going to let you in this show yes, or not. Yes. And they only show that photograph for like two seconds, three seconds. And, and that image has to really catch them, you know, because they're looking at thousands of photographs for that day. Yeah. And your, your piece, your photo has to, has to be dramatic enough to where it catches their eye. I love that. That's great. You know, so, so you want to have great shots of your work. And then you want to, again, have that CBW, that cohesive body of work, which is very important. So all of your work has to be cohesive. And then you're going to have a booth shot. You're going to have a photograph of your booth as it would be set up at the art show. And within, within that booth shot, you have to have the art that you are sending them and, and as, as far as getting into the show. So it, they, they know it's the same person. You know, you, right. you, you didn't go take a photograph of somebody else's booth. It's obviously yours, you know, right. and and make sure that's done absolutely fantastic. You're right. So lighting. before you do anything, you have to have if you're planning on doing 
an art festival. Yeah. You need to get, you need to go out and buy a booth. You need to go buy a tent. You need to purchase or build the walls that you're going to hang your artwork on. And then you need to either frame it or if you go with unframed artwork, you need to hang it on those walls and then photograph it. So you're making an initial investment to see that. Is there a special type of tent that they require? Well, they used to really uh, want the rounded top tent, the curve in the front. Uh, Now, a lot of artists are going with a really heavy duty industrial uh, pop-up type. Mm -hmm. You see, back in back in the day, the pop-ups are very cheaply built and they'll crumble under the first breeze. Whereas nowadays, there there, there's there's pop-up tents that are built like tanks, and these things are so powerful. Uh, Mine mine's gone through at least 50 mile an hour winds, and not a problem at all. Uh, Now, what makes my tent so strong? First, about the tent, I bought a thing called Pro Panels. Now, Pro Panels are carpeted walls extremely lightweight and they will velcro to the tent itself mm-hmm. and it makes the tent extremely rigid and so now when you put those up around the outside perimeter of your tent now you have on the inside a literal gallery because you have carpeted walls all the way around and it just it just has a, a nice cozy feeling mm-hmm. uh, you can go as far as buying a, a piece of 10 by 10 carpet and lay that down and put your your tent on top of that most most tents you're gonna let's just say you spend five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars for a tent. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is the best five hundred to a thousand dollars that you will ever spend because you'll have the tent for a long time, and it's always going to make you money. So this is not money you're spending. This is money that you're just investing for the future because you're gonna have this for years and years. Right. And, but by the same time, you're gonna get the walls, the pro panel walls. Those are around two hundred fifty dollars per panel. Again, the absolute wonderful investment because that is going to display your work better than someone who did not make that initial investment. So right. There's a mammoth difference in that because now you're, you have a professional display right. versus one that is not so professional. You know, mm-hmm. Some people just use netting or something, something like that. And as, as the wind is blowing, your art is moving back and forth. If, if you have kind of a windy day, it looks like the art's going to fall off the wall type of thing. Well, right, with, right. With, it's terrifying. Yeah. yeah. Well, with, with the pro panels, you don't have that. You know, I, right. I have hangers from pro panel and uh, mm-hmm. I just I hang the art on those. Now, I have learned, this is my, my personal experience through the years, uh, there you can double hang pieces, one on top of the other, all the mm-hmm. way around, or you can single hang. You know, if you have very small work, you can get away with uh, double or triple hanging, but, but between those triptychs that you hang up and down, I'll put a large piece. In other words, don't have a, a flat wall with 50 small pieces, you know, right. and it, that can get very confusing and it's hard for them to pick out one or, or two that they want unless you can move them. Right. Quickly. So uh, I would hang those very loosely, kind of, kind of one per panel all the way around. And now it's easy to understand when you take the photograph uh, and, and you send that in, the, the juror looks at that and it's not confusing. It's not like a bunch of little dots hanging on your wall. They, they see, oh, there's your style. That's the person. And that's the person I want in my show. Because they're also looking at, right. will, you, will you make their show look good? And that's a, that's a huge deal. Right. Uh, they want right. their show to have a certain look. Right. If you have, so if you have the right booth mm-hmm. and you have the right paneling, to display your artwork and you've made that investment, they see that A, you're serious. Yes. Made the investment beforehand to be in their show. So you are already getting off on the right foot with the jurors of the show, the the the, the people who work for the show and are promoting the show. You're already in, in good standing because that person's not it's not skidink to use a, a slang from my, my hometown. It, 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 it's professional. It's polished. It looks good. This is a, this is a serious, legit artist. Right. Because here's, here's what you're trying to overcome. You're trying to overcome the fact that you are taking people's credit card on the street out of a tent. <laughs> so you know, you know, <laughs> that is really, really funny to say, you know, I, I stand on the street. And have people give you their credit card 
and I get under my tent and I swipe their credit card. So that in itself is, is one thing to get, get past. But when you have an art show that where everybody is polished and professional, the, 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 the people, the patrons feel more comfortable. They think, oh, these people are right. all professionals. These, there, there are no shysters here. Obviously, nice. the, the art show has weeded out any possible shyster or whatever. Because right. other, other, other artists will always point out a shyster. So you can, you can be double sure that if you're in a type, type in show, it's a, it's a good show and everybody there is pretty much deserved to be there. You know? Right. And that, and that, and that, and that's a big thing, you know, because the, like you, you were saying, the event promoter, yes, they've worked very hard to make a show that is going to attract a certain clientele. Yes. Yep. And so they know that at this particular show, at this city, at this time of year, they're going to get a clientele that can purchase art from say a thousand dollars and up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or, or $5,000 and up, or, you know what I mean? They've got a bracket of their clientele's price ranges here. Yep. And so they want to make sure that the people that are creating the art are creating art that these people in this bracket are going to be wanting. And yep. people that are people that are willing to spend multiple thousands of dollars for a piece of art they're serious art collectors yes and yes. so they're they're a little more knowledgeable about yes. art very and much they're going to be a much more um they're savvy yeah very they're savvy. savvy yeah an educated an educated uh clientele and that and that's that means you've got to be you got to bring your a game and if you can't yep. bring your a game yep. that show may not be for you and of course the jury the jury's job is to weed out those that wouldn't be good for yes. their show. Right, precisely. And if you do get denied, you, that's that's fine. You just kind of understand that most artists get denied. You know, I, I have I have a whole stack of denial letters. You know, you don't get into every show. It costs thirty five bucks normally to sign up to be in an art show. You go to uh, uh, Zap Z A P P Z application mm -hmm. and that usually has a really good list of all the art shows that you want to you want to try out. Well, you click on it and you have your your account set up with your photographs of your work and your booth and you click on it and then you and then you PayPal the 35 bucks and that's the application to get into the show. At that point, they will have a jury day and they will jury the work and if you get in, they send you the email. Yep, you get you 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 made it, then you pay the rest of the show fee. And at that point, you are ready to go. Then, then you got to get prepared for the show and make sure that when you when you go there, you're going to have uh, your own water, your food, and so forth. Because you don't want to leave your booth and go to a restaurant uh, and, and leave your booth empty. Because you're only you're only open, you know, from ten to five normally. Mm -hmm. So you have you have maybe four good selling hours in there, and so those four hours are critical. You know, right. you have to be on, you got to be ready, you got to be happy. If you have a problem that day, you got to erase it from your mind. You got to, you have to be an actor. You know, you have to put on right. that, that, that confident face, you know, mm -hmm. and that loving face because another part of the whole, the whole experience. And I, I this is a guru moment. I'm going to about to, sh about to share with you. Yes, you know, Pat, no. <laughs> here, here's a guru moment. As you're speaking to the, the, the customer that wants to purchase your art. As you're speaking, every word you say, you're looking into their eye. You never, ever glance away at somebody behind them or whatever. Mm -hmm. Be very, very intent. And then in your own mind, you have to say to yourself, I love you. And I love what I'm doing. I love this moment. And that right there, believe it or not, I know it sounds like a chant almost. Right. But it makes a world of difference. You know, if you're telling your mind, because your mind, uh, it follows that first thought, you know, right. uh, whatever you're thinking, that's what you're going to do normally, you know? Yeah, so right, if right. If, or if, if you, if you demonstrate, God, I'm bored. Uh, this show is, is not working out. Uh, the people here don't spend money It shows and they won't buy, they won't right. spend money. You know? Right. It's, it's, it's what you feel is, is going to happen. Sometimes happens, you know, so you're going to be very careful at. Right. Uh, right. So when, I, when I'm there, I try to bring my gear and my attitude with me. 
you know. Nice. And it takes a great attitude adjustment and it takes practice, you know, right. to get that squared away. So when you said like from 10 to five is when, what do you do with the artwork when the show's in? You have to pack it up in your stuff or do you leave it there? What, how does it work? Well, the, the tent that you buy normally has really nice side walls that zipper down mm -hmm. and they're pretty thick. So uh, you would just zip it down and they have security. Most shows have security. Yeah, security. So they really have a problem, you know, because right. you don't, you don't want to be packing that up at night because, the shows don't want you driving in to the art show with your van or truck right? You know, while, while it's all set up. Right. So they've got it roped off. You zipper it up. Yeah. You, okay. That, 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 that's really interesting. That's really yeah. interesting. Um, you know, it's always fascinating to me to see how successful artists market and sell their work. What is their business plan? How do they do it? And yeah. uh, I've never done an art festival I, yeah. I have a tent. It's right above me in uh, the attic that is yeah. above my uh, former garage, now my yeah. beautiful art studio. And um, But at the same time, it's like I've always been curious. I've, I've got the tent. I, I don't have the walls. I would have to buy the walls. Um, but every different artist that I have on the show has their own marketing plan, their own way that they successfully – live the artist's life yeah. and it's always I, I love talking to different artists on how do they do it how do they do it the art festival is such a fascinating fascinating mm -hmm. way to do it you know some artists it's all about being in a gallery yeah right. it's all about representation at this gallery or that gallery yeah. um you've got a different route and it's the art festivals and it works really well for you and so yeah. you paint in your studio all year long and oh, yeah. then Take that art to about how many festivals do you do in a year and at what time of year do you do them in? I, I do roughly 18 to 20. Okay. Uh, and there are January, February, and then the rest are October, November. You know, so I have the, the early part of the year and the latter part of the year. And I do uh, some of the shows are in Alexandria, Virginia, around Washington area where uh, it's, it's not saturated with art shows. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 a long drive and all, but it's very pleasurable and always do well because one one more little tidbit of information, a guru moment <laughs> <laughs> is it for in the art show world, you have to your business plan is based on a your target income. How much do you really want to make for that year mm -hmm. or that month? Uh, and then you work backwards. So if, if you if you divide it by. 10 shows that you're going to do that year, you have to go that and then add up all of your expenses that you possibly can incur for that show, such as the, the, the entry fee, the gasoline, the hotel, the food and all that, have all that added up and then, then figure out how much money do you really have to make to, to have a profit margin where you can hit the goal for how much you want to make for the year. And right. that's very, very important. And you have to take taxes out of that, your income tax. Mm -hmm. I always tell people, go ahead and just do your quarterly taxes, get it over with, you know, right. have, all, have it pulled out. You never get into a situation where, oh, my gosh, I forgot to pay this, you know, get it all squared away. Right. That way you know what you're going to have at the end of the year almost. And mm -hmm. that mentally helps you move forward with your art because you already know what what you got to make and how much this piece should cost. Right. And so. So that that right there is, is, a, is a huge thing because you don't want to bring a bunch of ten dollar items to a show that you have to make ten thousand dollars. Right. It's not going to work. Make ten grand to make a profit. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. And, that, you know, that's such a huge thing is that, you know, as a professional artist, you have to make a living. And yeah. so you have to figure out your cost. You have to figure out your materials. You've got to figure out, you know, this, this, this and this, you know, yeah. uh, you know, I spend about just to give you an idea and, and the viewers, you know, for the type of art that I do and the work that I do um, for the last almost now a year, I've been having to buy because of all the pet portraits I've been doing recently. Um, I spend about three to four hundred dollars a month on canvases. Only. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just canvases, you know, yeah. um, because I'm buying you know, hundreds and hundreds of canvases every single month yes. on their small canvases, but it adds up. So I've got to factor that in. Then there's how much paint does it take? And then there's like, so I've figured out that one painting 
that I'm making, I know exactly how much it costs me to make that one painting. Yes. And that includes shipping, that includes everything. And then also how much that can, that one painting with taxes taken out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What, people don't realize that. You know, yeah, you people don't understand that. Tax. Professional artists, you got to be 50%. Well, sometimes I think it's more 60-40. 40% more art is 60% businessman. Yeah. Business yeah. it, it's work. And, you know, it's like I said in the beginning, Michelangelo, if people knew how hard I worked to achieve my mastery, they wouldn't think it's so wonderful, <laughs> you know? Oh, no. Yeah. People and, say, Pat, you're so lucky. You get to sit at home and just paint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that they would be so exhausted at two in the morning painting, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it's such a perfect analogy of what people really think. Right. You know, uh, now, the same so time, lucky. I will say that I've got some friends that will call me up and they'll, they'll be venting about their day or they'll be complaining. And they're like, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. and then they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, Tim. How was your day? I feel bad. I haven't asked you how your day was. I'm like, you don't want to know. Right. They're, <laughs> like, they're like, but you know, no, no, no. You go ahead. You tell me. You tell me. I've been venting. It's you, you go ahead. How was your day? And I'm like, you're going to get mad at me. <laughs> they're like, and they're like, they're like, all right, what did you do? And I'm like, well, you know, today I painted a, um, I painted a, a Pomeranian uh, in an elf costume. Yeah. And they're like, shut up, I hate you. Yeah. And I'm yeah, like, right, right. you wanted to be an accountant. You know, it's like. Yeah. But you know, in, in this world, uh, a lot of the the things that drive us forward or drive me forward are mistakes. Uh, I accidentally stumble into things that, wow, I didn't think about this. Look, look at that. This, this is a great idea. In fact, uh, this is what I paint with right here. I'm not sure if you can see. This is one of my brushes. Oh, I'm full screen in this. Yeah. You're getting this, soloed here. This is my secret to, to painting my style and i have a load of these nasty gnarly brushes and i i, I dip it in the thickest nastiest paint that i can get my hands on and uh i i, I do what's it's called it's, it's mixing uh oil with limestone so it gets really really thick and i'm gouging it in there and making these lines with all of these edges and whatnot and it gives it a heavy detail feel but also at the same time, heavy texture. So people look at the piece and they say, how on earth do you do that? And I said, well, oh, man, Simi uh, Jackson from Rosemary Brushes, her head just exploded. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, look at that brush. Yeah, yeah. I, I never sit there and, and analyze one inch of, of the piece. I'm painting the entire thing at one time with big deliberate strokes. It's just the style that I've, that I've kind of- That's your method. Well, no, I take that back. I accidentally fell into that style when I was younger. I'm not sure if you heard this story or whatever, but I, I, I did charcoal drawings when I was younger, but I, I, I did the fine detail stuff. It would take me a week to do one. Mm -hmm. And I did one that was 30 by 40. It was a big, big piece on, on heavy paper, hand, hand pressed paper. Mm -hmm. And I, I did this thing with charcoal and I went to this big show and people wanted to watch me finish it off, you know. So I was in New Orleans was before I was born and raised. I drank coffee like crazy. So I had this big table set up for me where I had the piece out, and I'm going to do some of the final details, sign it, and show people what it looks like. Well, uh, it was early in the morning, so I had my big coffee, uh, deep roast uh, coffee sitting on the corner of the table, and I am I'm finishing it off. And I'm reaching over to get another uh, piece of charcoal to sign it with. And my wrist hit the coffee just hard enough where it came back and doused the entire table along with my artwork with, with dark roast coffee. And uh -huh. It was a, a huge mess. So I, I panicked. I, I jumped back in my chair. I grabbed both edges of that piece of paper. And I lifted it up and I flung it really, really hard, trying to get the coffee up as fast as I could and not realizing I'm flinging coffee out into the crowd. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's getting worse. And at that point, everybody broke into applause. <laughs> how, how fantastic of an ending that was. They were like, art! <laughs> and, and what a command for the medium that he has. Like, I want that piece. That's great coffee painting. So... It sold that day, and it was kind of an auction deal, you know. No, I, I called it first. No, I want that piece, I, you know. And from that point forward, I knew there's something to the randomness 
of of art. It can't be just all completely uh, unchaotic. You know, sometimes there's art in the chaos, and so I am. I, I've used that ever ever since. And rather than coffee, I use a lot of sepia tone paint and colors and whatnot, really thin. And right. I kind of douse it all down and come back with layers on top yeah, of that. Yeah, it's probably not that archival. <laughs> no, 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 no. Right, right, right. But that right there was a life changer. It really was. And it was a total accident, something that I stumbled into. Who knows? And maybe God just said, you know, Pat, I'm going to give you a break. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Help the boy out. Yeah, I'm going to help the boy out. Well, Patrick, I just want to say thank you for coming on the show. Uh, you know, I am just blown away by, by, by this discussion. Uh, I mean, this was a really, really good discussion. And uh, I am just so happy to have you come on. We are definitely going to have to have you come on again um, yeah. because we can talk about so many things. But, yep. uh, you know, we talk about the art festivals. We talk your 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 explanation on how to talk to a customer yeah. and take yeah. them from a fan of your art to an owner of your art. Yes. Um, that was phenomenal. That was just fantastic. So uh, guys, if you've, yeah. uh, if you've been stayed with us this whole time, you, I know agree with me about how great this was. Um, share this video with your friends because it's going to be fantastic. But, but Patrick, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, I'm going to, uh, come over here and uh, and sign out over on my end. But thank you for coming on. You stick around with thank me. We'll talk a little bit afterwards. But thank you, uh, with that said, guy, thank you very much. Thank we you, sir. You coming on. Well, guys, that was amazing. <laughs> Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? This was going to be a good show. I knew it was going to be a good show. But even I had no idea that it was going to turn out this good. Wow. What a phenomenal phenomenal discussion. Uh, I think I'm going to have to turn this into uh, separate, like smaller chunked videos because we, we covered so many subjects, but wow, what a great, great uh, show we had today. Um, in a couple weeks, this will be on YouTube. I know I'm going to break it up into different sections, maybe make two or three videos out of it. I don't know yet, but uh, Patrick Reynolds, check his artwork out. Uh, search his name uh, and just put art and boom, he comes up right away. Um, he's got a pretty good uh, presence online with his website. Comes up really quick. Uh, here, I'll put it on the screen just real quick so you guys can see. Um, there it is right there, patrickjreynolds.com. And so go to his website, check him out. You can also find him on um, Facebook. And uh, he's got some great videos where he talks about his paintings and different things. You guys are really going to love him. So find him look him up. You guys are going to gonna love everything uh, there is about that. And so with that said, guys, uh, let me check who we have next week. Next week, we have got artist Julie Beck coming on. You are going to love her. She's, she's one of those artists that is so good. She is so skilled. It makes you want to get mad. Yeah, just like, she's so good, but you love her. So it's okay. But uh, so she's going to be on next week. And then uh, on the, uh, that's the 22nd of this month. And then on the 29th, we have Joe Corey from the SIVA organization, which is Christians in the Visual Arts, which is quite a big art organization uh, that, that people can join. And so he's going to be coming on and talking to us about the importance of artists finding a community that they can become a part of and how that community of artists can help them to grow as an artist. So we're going to be talking about uh, that with those guys. We've got so many things going on, but with that said, guys, uh, just remember God loves you. And so does your old pal, Tim, and we will talk with you soon.